iPhone. Turn off your mic. ماني عارف كيف احط ابراهيم كان يوم ميوت هم اللي اسمه ايفون ابراهيم سامعني ما 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 نقدر نسوي له ميوت يا دكتور ماني عارف طيب كذا ان شاء الله يكون شايف انه في زي الصدى ما ادري ايش طيب يلا ما في مشكله Uh, and during this lecture, we're going to cover uh, how to evaluate uh, prosthetic valve disease. Uh, we're going to go through all the prosthetic. We're going to go through the mitral aorta and uh, pulmonary and tricuspid valve. Both will try to touch on both uh, the bioprosthetic and mechanical valve. Uh, before we start, just quick uh, about the uh, equation that we're going to use uh, in this lecture. Uh, very important to know the area, and we discussed this previously. You divide it with the diameter and you uh, square it, multiply it by pi. A stroke volume, as you know, you multiply the area by the VTI and you will get the stroke volume. If you multiply the stroke volume with the heart rate, you will get the output. And then if you divide it by the body surface area, you will get the cardiac index. Uh, here, very important uh, to remind you that um, the continued which, which basically the volume at the point um, A. Uh, let me try to see if I can uh, share uh, the whole uh, the whole thing. The desktop. Okay. I think I'm sharing now the whole desktop. So uh, as you see here, that the, we can say that the volume across this area equal the volume across this area across A equal across B. And from that, you can calculate uh, the area. And we do that by first calculating the stroke volume, which is the area multiplying with the VTI here. Uh, or you can do the flow. Uh, you can do the flow or the VTI, and then you multiply it by uh, the, uh, here, uh, divided by this uh, VTI across this area. And from that, you're going to get the area. Uh, so this is how we use uh, the continuity equation to determine the area uh, of point uh, A2. Uh, and this is very important because uh, we, this we're going to use it to determine the, uh, for example, uh, uh, aortic valve area. We're going to use it for to, to determine the mitral valve area and all other valves. Uh, so it's very important to know this. And uh, the other important thing, uh, and uh, we should touch on that this uh, equation can be used only if there is no uh, regurgitation in one of these area. Uh, and I'm going to ask this question, and let's make it more interaction uh, and more discussion in this uh, uh, topic. So let's say that you want uh, to calculate the mitral valve area. Uh, let's say this is, uh, it will be here, the first one, it will be the mitral valve area. You want to determine the mitral valve area uh, based on the LVOT. Uh, so and the patient has aortic regurgitation. Can we determine the uh, mitral valve area or not? Can anyone ask? Can we determine the, the mitral valve area based on the LVO stroke volume if the patient has aortic rigors? Yes, we can. Uh, are you sure? Anyone? Any other answer? But, but how? How? Let me ask you how. So I think some some people are trying to answer. Oh, yeah, Hassan uh, said no. Uh, Hassan, why do you think we cannot? Uh, because the stroke volume, because the stroke volume of LVOT would be higher than the stroke volume of the mitral valve. So it would be it would be the, uh, the continuous equation cannot be applied at this time. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so this is a very important point that if you want to calculate, you have to make sure that the stroke volume across 
the area number one, it's equal the stroke volume across area number two. So if the patient has regurgitation here, the area here will be like, uh, so if you're gonna use it, there'll be, and the patient aortic regurg, you're gonna overestimate the mitral valve area because the stroke volume, it will be higher here. And then when you divide it by the VTI of the mitral valve, you're gonna get a higher overestimation of the mitral valve area. Uh, but what you can do, the other way to do this, you can use the RVOT. So instead of the LVOT, you can use the RVOT, assuming that you don't have a significant pulmonary rigor. Uh, and this is a very important point. And uh, the other point also that I will tell you that if the patient, let's say the patient has um, normal, uh, he doesn't have aortic rigor, he has normal uh, aortic valve, and you want to uh, calculate the mitral valve area and the patient has a mitral rigor, can we calculate it? It will be the same concept that you cannot calculate it because here the stroke volume across the mitral valve will be larger than the stroke volume across uh, the, uh, the LVOT or the aorta. Uh, so for that reason, if you do it, you're gonna underestimate the mitral valve area because you have a small stroke volume in the aortic valve area, so across the LVOT. Uh, so in the case of the mitral uh, rigor, we cannot calculate uh, in the patient with the prosthetic, we cannot calculate uh, the area uh, uh, using the continuity equation. Uh, and the other uh, thing that also to mention that in, if the patient, for example, you want to calculate the aortic area uh, and you want to do it based on the LVOT stroke volume, because you can calculate the LVOT area multiplied by VTI and then divided by the VTI of the aortic valve, and then you will calculate the area. Uh, if the patient has mitral rigor, it will not affect your calculation. If, even if the patient has aortic uh, valve rigor, it will also not affect because the stroke volume will be the same across both. Uh, so there will be increase in the stroke volume across both, across the LVOT and across the aortic valve. Um, so the area will not be affected. So still, you can calculate it. Uh, the last thing that I want to mention that if you have um, uh, shunt uh, across the, uh, let's say, uh, like for example, VSD, uh, VSD also, it will affect your calculation. Uh, for example, if you want to calculate the mitral valve area uh, and you have a VSD, uh, you cannot do this uh, based on the uh, LVOT or even uh, RVOT, both, you cannot calculate it. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you have an ASD, uh, you can't calculate the mitral valve area based on the LVOT, but you cannot do it based on the RVOT, because if you do the RVOT, you, the, you basically you're calculating the shunt. And this is how we calculate the shunt. When we want to calculate, if the patient has a shunt and we want to calculate the, uh, the shunt, the volume shunt, uh, we calculate the LVOT and we calculate the RVOT and the difference will give us uh, the amount of shunt, assuming that also the patient does not have any significant regurgitation in the valve. If the patient has significant regurgitation, still you cannot calculate the shunt accurately and you cannot calculate uh, the area accurately. So this is very important and basic uh, uh, things that you need to remember. Uh, and we're gonna use this information later on. Uh, later, and then here, you know, all of these, uh, this is the pressure gradient, how to calculate it based on the Bernoulli equation. Um, I will skip the last point for now. Uh, so we're gonna go now through some uh, basic principles about the prosthetic uh, valve. Uh, and this is even important even for your board exam. So remember that we, we usually recommend uh, to do a transthoracic, baseline transthoracic uh, between six uh, up to uh, 12 weeks uh, post-surgery. And the reason we, we prefer to do this uh, after six weeks post-surgery, because usually those patients, they will have anemia, hyperdynamic, they will be in hyperdynamic state. So the gradient will be higher. Uh, so it's better to wait for at least six weeks and then you do the echo. Uh, so you can have baseline um, echo for the patient in terms of the gradient, velocity, and that will be very helpful uh, in the future uh, when your uh, patients develop any symptoms and you repeat the echo, you can compare the gradient and see if there is any change in the gradient or velocity or anything. Uh, and this we do it with all patients uh, who has both, regardless, bioprosthetic or uh, mechanical valve. In terms of the follow-up, this is also important for your exam, uh, that we usually say that there is no rule for routine uh, echo in the patient with the mechanical valve. 
however, in the patient with the biprosthetic valve, we usually say uh, the ACC recommend to uh, repeat an echo after five years and then an another echo after 10 years and then yearly after that. Uh, and of course, you're gonna do echo for if the patient develop any symptoms. Uh, the other point that uh, to remember that all prosthetic valve, uh, usually they have higher gradient than native valve. Uh, so uh, this is why it's very important to compare uh, the gradient uh, to compare to the baseline, or you can compare it to the uh, normal uh, range references. Uh, there is already published uh, tables uh, for the normal. Uh, pressure gradient for each valve that you can use and you can uh, compare uh, to your uh, valve. Uh, the other thing also that all patients will have, like usually the mechanical valve, they always have uh, this transvalvular regurgitation, which is normal washing jet. And this is important actually, because it prevents uh, the clot from forming and the valve itself. Uh, on the other hand, the paravalvular uh, regurgitation always is abnormal. We cannot say that this is a physiological or something like that. No, it's always abnormal. Uh, and then the other thing that uh, uh, TEE is always, we recommend TEE in, this, in any patient that we are concerning about uh, vegetation, because usually it's really hard uh, to see the vegetation uh, from the transparency, because you will have a lot of shadowing. Uh, so most of the time, uh, it's recommended to do TEE if you have any suspicion that the patient has uh, endocrine carditis and the patient with the mechanical valve is to do to go ahead with the TEE. Also evaluation of the mitral valve always is better with the TEE. Uh, if you have any suspicion that the patient have uh, dysfunction valve or abnormality, you always need to do TEE for this patient. It's important, I will show you now some images about how the shadowing uh, can affect uh, your diagnosis. And you should know this because this will affect your evaluation. For example, if you want uh, to do barosternal view, uh, for the mitral valve, you will see that the shadowing will cover uh, if you have any barosternal uh, regurg uh, bar regurgitation, or I mean, I mean uh, barovalvular regurgitation, the posterior uh, side, uh, you will see that the shadow will cover it. Uh, it will be really hard to see it from here. But if you do the TEE, you will be very able to see it very clearly. Also, even if you do the uh, four chamber view, you will see here that the shadowing will almost cover for you uh, most of the atrium. Uh, so it will be really hard sometimes to see the regurgitation, the uh, baravalvular regurgitation of the mitral valve. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of the aorta, it will be difficult to see the baravalvular if you have uh, posterior uh, baravalvular leak. Uh, anterior, it's much easier. Uh, so here I, I, I will say that the posterior, it will be better to see it with the TEE but however, the TEE will not uh, see the barovalvular if it, uh, for the anterior. The anterior barovalvular it will be difficult to be seen uh, with the TEE. But it, maybe it's better to be seen uh, by uh, transthoracic. And of course, the uh, apical view, it will help you a lot uh, to see uh, the barovalvular leak uh, for the aortic valve. I think even for, uh, we always say that uh, even if when you do the TEE, always go deep gastric uh, to be able to see uh, the aortic uh, regurgitation because from the short axis, like from the aortic short axis view, it's uh, from this, uh, if you are in the esophagus uh, view, it will be sometimes difficult to see uh, the barovalvular leak. We always, for all patients, like whenever you do the transthoracic, you need to uh, evaluate first uh, by 2D uh, the valve itself, uh, the ring, uh, the stability of the valve. Uh, also, you need to evaluate the RV and LV size and function. And you, of course, evaluate the other uh, valves uh, related, um, which can be affected also. Uh, in terms of the hemodynamic by Doppler, you need to check the, uh, the CW across the valve itself. And that will, the signal uh, from the Doppler, it, it will help you determine the severity of the regurg and also the severity uh, the, based on the peak velocity. You can, from that there, you can calculate the peak velocity and the gradient. Uh, you can calculate the VTI, dimensional velocity index, pressure half time, and effective orifice area, as well as uh, the location uh, of the regurgitation based on the color. Uh, these are uh, the mechanical valve. Uh, the most common uh, used currently is the bileaflet, uh, the first one, bileaflet. Uh, and this is how it looks like uh, with the echo. You will see two discs, uh, two moving discs. 
and usually you will have the washing this uh, jet uh, across the valve itself. Uh, the single uh, disc, uh, tilt disc, usually is not used uh, as much now, uh, but usually you will have one main uh, uh, transvalvular jet, which is normal, and we have the caged ball uh, disc uh, valve, which is not being used now anymore. So you will not see it even, you will see, see it only in the very old patient who had uh, his uh, procedure a long time ago, then maybe you will see it. But otherwise, most of the cases, you will see these patients with the two disc. Uh, these are the common by uh, prosthetic uh, uh, valve that is used now. We have the uh, stented uh, valve and we have the stentless uh, valve uh, and we have the valve that we use with the TAVI. Uh, and we see here that uh, the patient with the uh, stentless uh, valve, sometimes it's very hard actually to tell that the patient has um, a valve without looking to that he has an open heart surgery uh, because it's almost like a native. Uh, the good thing about this valve, the stentless valve, uh, usually they will have even better uh, hemodynamic. But the only problem with these valve, the stentless valve, uh, with time, they might have dilatation of the aortic root and they will start to develop intravalvular uh, leak. But uh, we don't see that this uh, intravalvular leak uh, with the stent, uh, stented uh, valve because they will have fixed valve. Uh, the stentless valve, as you know, that we usually use it in the aortic um, uh, valve, uh, with the aortic valve replacement. Uh, but the stent, uh, stented valve, usually we use it for both. Uh, we can use it for both for the aorta and the mitral. Uh, these are the stented valve, the common one that is currently used. And uh, here, the stentless valve that is also uh, being used now. Uh, and which has better, as I told you, hemodynamic uh, than the stented valve. Here, the human tissue valve, and we have the aortic homograft and pulmonary uh, autograft. And over here, we have the sutureless bioprosthetic valve. Uh, this, uh, these uh, considered as a, a new valves. Uh, uh, for example, the perceval uh, valve, the first one, all these valves, it has the same, almost the same concept. So it's deployed. Uh, it's almost, you can say that it, it's almost like a, a TAVI. Uh, but the difference here, the, the surgeon will uh, do a small uh, incision uh, in the aorta and it will, he will insert or she will insert uh, the valve and deploy it. Uh, and it will be balloon it uh, inside the aorta. Uh, but before that, it will, of course, he will remove the old uh, leaflet and then he will place uh, this. The only problem with this perceival valve and all these uh, uh, suture less valve, uh, the risk of paravalvular leak is higher than uh, the uh, other valves. And this is the problem with these valves. Uh, the good thing about these valves, uh, it will be a short procedure. It will help you to reduce the time uh, for the procedure. But the problem, uh, it can be associated with the uh, uh, baravalvular leak. Uh, so it's very important that uh, you really uh, need to assess the valve uh, when you do a TEE during the procedure to make sure that the patient does not have uh, a baravalvular leak. Uh, TAVI is the same. Uh, the only problem with the TAVI and the suture list, it's the problem with the baravalvular leak. So these patients, they will be higher at higher risk of baravalvular leak compared uh, when you compare it to the uh, suture uh, valve and uh, other uh, surgical valves. And uh, these a couple of the, the new generation uh, surgical uh, bioprosthetic like trifecta. Uh, it has uh, kind of uh, it has better marking for future intervention. It will help you uh, when you evaluate these with uh, uh, prosthetic. So this is the tables for. Uh, most of the uh, valves, very important. Of course, you will not remember these uh, for your, your exam, even if you're your clinical practice, but you need to have uh, these tables and uh, to know these tables and to have it as a reference for you. Uh, so you can see here all the name of the valves, like most of the valves that currently used and uh, the size of each valve and the area. Uh, so uh, this is the area of each valve. So th these are very helpful uh, to know this because uh, first, it will help you to predict if the patient can have uh, patient prosthesis mismatch. And also, uh, 
when you calculate it uh, later on, we'll talk about uh, when you calculate it to evaluate uh, the aortic valve with the high gradient uh, or mitral valve, it will help you also determine if the patient has uh, prosthesis mismatch or not. And these are the definition for uh, patient prosthesis mismatch. Uh, so for the aortic area, we say that uh, when you divide the aortic valve area by the body surface area, uh, if it, uh, it, should, it should be uh, more than 0.85. Uh, and if it's less than that, it's considered as a moderate. If it's less than 0.65, it's considered as a severe. For the mitral A uh, valve, the uh, threshold will be different. It'd be 1.2 and uh, less than 0.9 for severe uh, patient prosthesis mismatch. Uh, for the patient who are uh, these or overweight uh, with body mass index more than 30, uh, we use different threshold because those patients, of course, if you divide uh, their aortic valve area by their body surface area, it's always going to be low. And we know now with more study that uh, those obese patients, they don't need a higher valve area. Uh, so if the patient has body mass index more than 30, always use uh, the other threshold, not the uh, regular threshold that we use with the patient with the normal habit. Uh, of course, you, you need to remember, and we talked about this in the previous uh, lecture, that uh, pressure recovery, uh, it can occur also in the patient with the small uh, aortic valve, and the patient, regardless if the patient has a mechanical or a native valve. Um, here, we discussed previously, and I'm not going to go through this uh, this time, uh, how to calculate uh, how, and how to adjust uh, for the small aortic valve area uh, to determine what is the correct uh, aortic valve area. Uh, but the important thing to know here um, that in the patient with the bileaflet uh, uh, mechanical valve, those patients sometimes they will have a local high gradient, uh, and this is different than the pressure recovery. Uh, so these patients, because they have higher velocity across the central opening, so as you see here that this is the bileaflet, the mechanical bileaflet, you will see that you have lateral opening and you have central opening. So those patients, they will have higher velocity across the central uh, opening. So if you measure the velocity here across the central opening, uh, you will get higher gradient. Uh, so these patients, they will have higher gradient. However, uh, they will be asymptomatic because uh, the pressure will go back uh, in the aorta, it will go back uh, uh, to higher uh, side. Uh, so those patients, they will not have any significant symptoms. Uh, so uh, you have two ways to do it. Determine uh, if you are in the central when you measure the uh, velocity. If you are measuring the velocity from the central or the lateral, uh, usually we do it by TEE for the mitral valve. It's easy uh, to do uh, this by the TEE. And sometimes with the transparency, if you have a good image, you can measure the velocity across the lateral opening, not across the central opening. Because central opening will have higher velocity. And of course, always you need to compare. Uh, your uh, TEE with the baseline TEE. So, and you can tell if this is um, a baseline patient has high gradient or not. So now we'll go through the aortic. Yes, go ahead. Someone ask me. Oh, I think the mic, that mic. Okay. Uh, so for the aortic valve, uh, we'll go first uh, through the, how we evaluate a patient with the aortic valve uh, stenosis, prosthetic aortic valve stenosis. So the first step uh, through the continuous wave, uh, through the continuous wave, you can measure uh, the contour of the uh, blood across the aortic valve. Uh, and from that, you can trace uh, this contour. Uh, and from that, you can determine uh, the peak velocity. Uh, you can determine the, uh, also the peak and mean uh, pressure gradient. And also you will uh, determine the VTI itself. And also from here, you can measure the acceleration time. Acceleration time, it's from the beginning of the, from the opening of the valve all the way to the peak. So, uh, so from here, it will be from here all the way to here, because this is your peak. Uh, and also you will need to measure from this view, uh, the ejection time. Ejection time, it will be from the beginning all the way to the end from the beginning of the aortic valve to the uh, closure of the aortic valve. And you can also uh, divide these two numbers to get the ratio, uh, because this is very important uh, in terms of the uh, uh, 
uh, evaluation for the and to diagnose patient with the aortic valve uh, stenosis. Uh, so, for example, uh, here uh, we always say that the aortic valve velocity should be less than three uh, meter per second in terms of the velocity. Uh, in terms of the uh, acceleration time, uh, it should be less than 100 and, uh, milliseconds. And for the ratio, it should be less than 0.4. So it should be less than 40%, uh, percent, uh, the ratio of the acceleration time to the ejection time. And then also in addition, uh, after you evaluated the uh, velocity across the uh, aortic valve, you need to evaluate uh, the LVOT diameter, and also you need uh, to measure uh, the LVOT VTI. Uh, so from here, I will say uh, for, uh, for the LVOT VTI, you will measure both the peak velocity and the VTI uh, of the LVOT. Uh, as you remember, we talked about this in the previous lecture that uh, you need to make sure that the uh, sampling uh, of the pulse wave here we do it with the pulse wave. So the sampling should be in the LVOT from the five chamber view or from the uh, three chamber view. And it should be within one centimeter uh, from the valve itself uh, when you measure. You cannot put the uh, sampling uh, in, inside the valve because if you sample inside the valve, you will have higher uh, velocity and higher VTI and you're gonna overestimate uh, the aortic valve area. So you need to be careful and you need to measure it before the valve itself. In terms of the diameter, we always say that we measure the diameter for after uh, surgical valve, uh, you need to measure it before the valve. So it should be from here, somewhere from here, all the way here in the LVOT, within, like we say, within like half centimeter uh, from the valve itself, uh, you will measure the LVOT. Um, and this is for the surgical valve, uh, for the, patient who has TAVI, I will show you later on the images how to measure for the TAVI patient, but it will be a little bit different, but we're gonna go through it later on. Uh, so once you calculate the LVOT uh, diameter and the VTI, then from that you can first calculate the dimension less index. For example, here we have the maximum velocity of the LVOT VTI, it's 0.9. Uh, and then here 0.2, uh, 2.3. So you will divide 0.9 divided by 2.3. Here, if you do it, of course, uh, this is gonna be more than uh, 0.3. Uh, and if it's more than 0.3, this is normal. Uh, and also from this view, also you can calculate uh, the aortic valve area. We, we call it the effective orifice area, effective orifice area. Uh, so we'll do the same way that we did it in the previous, uh, lecture, so you will divide the LVOT uh, diameter by two, and you will square it, multiply it by pi, and then you multiply it by the VTI, the 19, and then you will divide it by the VTI of the aorta, which is uh, 47. Then you will get the aortic valve area. Uh, so, and then from, you can compare even later on uh, with the reference that you have, so you can tell that if it, this is normal or not normal. This uh, slide is very important, I think, and uh, I'm sure that they can ask in the uh, board exam about this uh, slide, and you really need to memorize it. Like there is no other way. Uh, so, and it's inshallah simple uh, to memorize. Uh, so, and this is how we evaluate patient with the uh, aortic valve stenosis, prosthetic aortic valve stenosis. First, if the velocity less than three meter uh, per second, we can say that this is normal. Unless, of course, if the patient has severe uh, LV uh, systolic dysfunction and has a low flow, low gradient, that will be a different story. But if the patient has normal LV systolic function and the velocity less than three meter per second, you can say that this is normal and you can you don't need to go through this. But if it's more than three meter uh, per second, then you, you need to calculate the dimensional velocity uh, index. Uh, and the dimension uh, less velocity index, we, we can simplify this. We, we can say that if the patient uh, dimensional velocity index less than three, well, less than 0.3, like it's here or here, and the acceleration time more than 100, you can always say this is uh, prosthetic uh, valve stenosis. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, if the patient has uh, dimensional list index more than 0.25 and with the time less than 100, this patient has normal uh, prosthetic valve, and then you need to calculate the effective orifice area and divide it by the body surface area. And once you do that, if it's normal, then you can say that the patient just have high flow uh, state, like for example, in the patient with uh, uh, aortic regurg or the patient with the anemia, patient with the hyperthyroidism, all these uh, with the high infection, fever, all these can give you a high flow state. Uh, on the other hand, if the effective orifice area index is than the threshold that I showed you previously in the previous um, slides here, it is, for example, uh, less than 0.65, you can say that this patient have severe uh, patient prosthetic mismatch. The last thing that if the patient has more than 0.3 dimensional velocity index, but the acceleration time is more than 100, there are two possibilities that maybe the patient has subvalvular narrowing, subvalvular membrane or something, causing a narrowing or uh, LBOT obstruction causing narrowing. Uh, and that would be one differential diagnosis. Uh, the other thing also that, is it clear? Uh, you, my, I don't know if you have a problem with the net. Other possibility that you might be either uh, and overestimating the LVOT. So maybe instead of measuring the LVOT pulse wave before the valve, you went inside the valve. If you go inside the valve, you will have higher DVI, more than 0.3, but you will have increased acceleration time. So you need to adjust. Or it's possible also that you are underestimating the gradient of the aortic valve. Maybe your echo beam was not uh, aligned with the uh, blood flow. And that will give you an underestimation of the aortic valve gradient. And it will give you higher uh, dimensional velocity index with the high uh, acceleration time. Uh, so this is basically how to interpret uh, and how to use this slide. You have to memorize it because in the board exam, they're gonna give you, a, for, for example, a case and they will give you that, the, uh, for example, velocity, it's more than three. And then you calculate the uh, DVI and the DVI more than uh, 0.3. Uh, and then it will give you the, for example, they will tell you that the acceleration time is less than 100. And then they will give you maybe a small effective orifice area. Then you will say that uh, patient uh, prosthesis is match. In the board exam, they really like to make sure that you can differentiate between the patient prosthesis mismatch and uh, patient with the root two uh, prosthetic stenosis. So this is how you differentiate between the two. Uh, this is another approach, a very simple approach. Uh, you, you can say that if the patient has high gradient with normal uh, effective orifice area and DVI, which is more than this, you immediately calculate the index. Uh, if it's less than 0.85, uh, then this is patient prosthesis mismatch. And if it's uh, more than that, this is, would be the high uh, flow state. On the other hand, if the patient has a abnormal uh, DVI or uh, and the effective orifice area, uh, you, you will evaluate the valve itself. And if there is abnormality in the leaflet itself, you can say this is due to stenosis. And if there is no abnormality, you will say this is second is to pressure recovery because patient with the pressure recovery, they will have higher gradient uh, low dimension velocity index, low effective orifice area, but the valve itself, when you look on the valve, at the valve, we'll see that normal leaflets uh, without any abnormal, without any limitation in the movement of these leaflets. Uh, this again, the normal value of the uh, prosthetic valve, we always say that the velocity should be less than three, main gradient less than 20, uh, dimensional list index less than point, uh, more than 0.3. An effective orifice area should be more than 1.2. Uh, the, uh, the velocity, uh, the, continu the continuous wave uh, should be, uh, the diagram should be like triangular with early peaking uh, with acceleration time less than 80 um, milli per second. Uh, this is another example. Uh, you will see that here the patient in the right side 
uh, that the velocity is going all the way. This is the aortic valve, uh, uh, continuous wave across the aortic valve. So we can see here the uh, velocity going all the way to five. So if we are gonna use the, our uh, diagram that we showed previously, you will say that this is above three. Then I'm gonna go to evaluate the dimension of velocity index. And we see that the dimension of velocity index is uh, less than 0 0.25. And then I will say, uh, I'm gonna see the acceleration time and the acceleration time here from the beginning all the way to the uh, peak, it's uh, 180. Uh, so 180, it's more than 100. So this is typical, like if you go through the flow, you will say this is stenosis because the patient will, you will go like this, that the patient has a stenosis. Uh, on the other hand, this patient has normal velocity, normal DVI, and normal acceleration time. Here again, um, and we went through this, how to calculate the effective orifice area. Uh, you measure the DVI, and then uh, you multiply it by the VOT VTI and divide it by the aortic VTI. And uh, as I mentioned, you will try to measure it before the valve itself. Uh, this is uh, another patient. Uh, this patient has a um, uh, TAVI, and you will see that here we, we uh, yes, uh, here the TAVI. The TAVI, uh, as I told you that in the surgical valve, post-surgical valve, we usually measure the LVOT before the valve itself, uh, within 0.5 centimeter. However, in the TAVI patient, uh, it depends on the location of the valve. Uh, so for example, if the patient has a, the valve, it's not going all the way like here. You will see here that the, the valve, it's going all the way uh, uh, to the LVOT. But here, the, uh, and it's too deep, uh, the valve here. Uh, on the other hand here, the uh, inward valve, you will see that it's, uh, it's not all the way. Uh, so you can measure the LVOT easily here. Uh, so the way that we do it for, uh, Tabby, we go outer to outer, from the outer edge of the valve all the way to the outer edge of the valve. And uh, in terms of the patient, with if it has a too deep valve, then you have to measure it from inner to inner edge. Uh, so you need to measure it from inner to inner. And when you measure the LVOT, BTI, for example, if you measure it outer to outer, make sure that you put the uh, cursor before the valve when you measure the VTI of the LVOT and the, with the pulse wave. Uh, but if you measure it inner to inner, because uh, like as you see here, you see that the valve is too deep. So if you are trying to measure uh, the valve uh, here, you cannot because uh, it would be too big. Uh, so, uh, so when you do the uh, Hello? Hello? Is the sound clear? Yes, the sound is clear. Okay, I'm going to show you the sound. I will share again. Uh, so as I said, that uh, when you measure uh, uh, the wave here, in this case, it's small, but it's too deep. Then you have to measure it from inside. You will measure the LVOT from inside, uh, inner to inner edge, and also the pulse wave from inside. Uh, so this is how we measure uh, the LVOT uh, for the patient post uh, post TAVI. So if we go back to our patient here, uh, you will see that, uh, like if we want to evaluate this patient, uh, we'll start by the velocity. We see here clearly that the velocity across the aortic valve, it's uh, 2.11. So we can say that actually you, you don't need to go through all the process, but of course, if you, when you write your echo report, it's always better to write what is the velocity aortic valve, what is the pressure gradient, what is the mean gradient as a reference um, uh, for future uh, to compare with echo. Uh, so we always prefer to write all these. And, Easily say that this is the velocity is normal. Uh, even you, if you check the pressure gradient and uh, maximum pressure gradient across the aortic valve, it's completely normal. If you calculate the uh, dimensional uh, velocity index, uh, you will divide uh, the maximum velocity of the LVOT. It's one, 
divided by uh, two, uh, you're almost gonna get uh, almost uh, 0.5, which is completely normal. And uh, also you can uh, calculate the effect of this area by the contributing equation that we discussed. Uh, here, uh, another patient, uh, you will see here that there is an increase. We can see an increase in the velocity. The velocity is 3.1. Uh, so we can say this is there is a, a pathology. So if you go through the process that we discussed, uh, so you will divide the uh, maximum velocity in this of the LVOT, which is 0 0.27, divided by three. You for sure you will get something less than 0.25. Uh, the acceleration time. We see that the acceleration time clearly that it's going to be more than if you measure it, it will be more than 100. Uh, so from this, you can say that the patient has true uh, prosthetic stenosis. Uh, and then, uh, of course, you need to look to the valve itself to see what is the problem. In this valve, there is a thrombus. If you see here, there is a thrombus in the valve itself. And this was post-TAVI, uh, uh, like six months post-TAVI. And these patients, usually we treat them with the anticoagulation. And most of these patients, uh, the th their thrombus will uh, resolve uh, without ne the need for any intervention. Uh, so we're done with the prosthetic aortic valve stenosis. In terms of the regurgitation, uh, this is the approach that we used to use for a uh, patient post-surgical valve. Post-surgical valve, let me see if anyone asking. Oh, you got the asshole. Okay, no problem. Let's see the internet, I'm going to see طيب إن شاء الله كذا يكون أفضل على هذا الإنترنت. Okay. Uh, so for the patient who, who's post surgical valve, uh, usually this is the way that we evaluate uh, the valve. We look to the uh, the valve itself. If there is any abnormality in the structure of the valve. Of course, if there is any abnormality, this is toward either moderate or uh, severe. We look to the LV size. We look to the, uh, the ratio of the jet width uh, to the LVOT. If it's more than 65%, this indicate that this is a significant severe. We look to the pressure half time. If it's less than 200, also we consider this is as significant. And then we can also do the quantitative measurement of the regurgitation. Here, the quantitative measurement, we do it uh, by calculating the LVOT stroke volume and calculating the RVOT stroke volume and we do a subtraction and once you do minus uh, the LVOT here will, uh, stroke volume will be larger than your uh, RVOT stroke volume and you do minus and then if you divide it by the LVOT stroke volume you will get the uh, regurgitant fraction uh, and also you calculate based on that also if you calculate the uh, our take about uh, uh, the PTI of the regurg regurgitation, you can also uh, calculate the effective orifice area. Uh, but uh, the way that we usually use the, the, in the patient post-TAVI, when you we evaluate the aortic uh, regurgitation, we usually we use this uh, uh, table uh, or this uh, diagram. Uh, so, uh, for example, we look for any criteria for severe aortic rigors. So if the vena contracts more than 0.6, uh, or vena contracta area. Uh, and vena contracta area, you can calculate it by 2D or by 3D. Uh, if it's more than 0.3, uh, or, or uh, the percentage for the patient who has paravalvular leak, if the uh, percentage of the paravalvular leak covering more than 30% of the circumferential of the, of the valve itself, or if there is a large uh, flow conversion, which is uh, the PISA, or the pressure have time less than 200 uh, million per second, or if there is a, a diastolic uh, reversal in the ab abdominal uh, aortic uh, aorta or the descending aorta of the thoracic, that all indicate uh, that the patient has a severe aortic regurgitation. So if you have four criteria, then you can say that the patient has severe aortic regurgitation. Uh, 
uh, on, and then uh, you can even don't go through the quantitative, but of course you can do the quantitative if there is any doubt. And uh, as I mentioned that you, we do the quantitative based on the RBOT stroke volume. But of course, this assuming that the patient does not have uh, pulmonary rigor. So if the patient have pulmonary valve rigor, you cannot use the RBOT as your reference. But you can use the mitral valve as your reference if the patient doesn't have mitral valve rigor. Uh, so you can use either uh, the pulmonary, uh, the RBOT, or the mitral valve. Uh, these are the way that we measure uh, the circumferential uh, percentage as well as uh, the vena contracta area. Uh, of course, you need to make sure that you are crossing the valve itself. You are not too deep uh, to the LVOT because if you are too deep to LVOT, uh, you are exaggerating uh, the regurgitation, the shape of the regurgitation. So you need to be exactly in the vena at the, at the uh, location of the vena contracta. Uh, and then you, you measure the area uh, from this view, uh, as well as uh, percentage of the circumference. So if the uh, percentage less than 10%, uh, this will be considered as mild, like here. Uh, this is the circumferential percentage of the uh, paravalvular leak compared to the circumferential of the valve itself. Uh, but if it's uh, between 20, uh, 10 uh, all the way to 30, these are, we consider it as a moderate. And if it's more than that, uh, it's considered more than 30% considered as uh, severe. And here, if you calculate the vena contracta area, also you will see that here it's going all the way to 0.7, which consider as a severe. Uh, this is a, a good a diagram to, to know uh, the location of the barovalvular leak. Uh, so when you are doing, uh, because we usually, when we report the barovalvular leak, we report it based on the clock. Uh, um, from the, uh, when you look to the short axis of the aortic valve, we consider this is at 12 o'clock and this is six o'clock, uh, three o'clock and nine o'clock. So if you are looking, uh, sometimes it's really difficult uh, to have a good short axis view. So you can use also the bar center view to know, uh, to locate uh, the bar valvular uh, regurgitation. So from the bar sternal view, uh, anteriorly it will be 12 o'clock, posteriorly will be six o'clock uh, from the Five chamber view anteriorly will be nine o'clock and posterior will be four o'clock. And from the three chamber view or long axis view, you will have one o'clock anteriorly and posterior will be seven o'clock. Uh, so you, you, you're gonna determine the location of the uh, barovalvular leak based on the, uh, these uh, views. Uh, and this is very helpful because sometimes we don't always need to change the valve if the patient has a barovalvular leak. Sometimes we can do a blood. Uh, and we can block the valve. Uh, so this is uh, how we do the, uh, we measure the bar, uh, pressure half time. So the pressure half time, you will uh, measure it through the, the continuous wave across the aortic valve. And then you will measure the pressure half time, which is the steep, how steep uh, is the uh, flow. So the more steep, uh, the more severe uh, the aortic valve will be. Uh, so as we said that if it's less than 200 millisecond, uh, we consider as a severe uh, aortic uh, rigor. And if it's more than five, we consider it as uh, mild. And of course, if it's very dense, uh, as you see here, it's very dense. Uh, that also indicate uh, that the patient has significant uh, moderate, or uh, yani at least we can say at least it's moderate uh, or severe uh, rigor. Here we can see the, uh, the aortic reversal the diastolic flow reversal. Uh, so here uh, we are measuring this by pulse wave uh, in the descending aorta. Uh, so for the descending aorta, we always say that uh, the descending aorta to say it's significant because sometimes patient can have uh, a re some reversal in descending aorta. And usually this is secondary to uh, stiff uh, aorta. Uh, we see it in the elderly and those patients with hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Uh, so to say that it's significant, that end velocity need to be more than 20, say it's significant, the end velocity. Uh, but for if the patient has a positive uh, abdominal uh, reversal, that will be considered as a significant immediately. You don't need, uh, like as you see here, we consider it as a significant if it's more than 20 uh, centimeter per second, the velocity of the 
end of the, uh, the thoracic uh, reversal. But for the abdominal, we always consider it as uh, significant. Uh, one of the consider as one of the specific criteria for uh, severe aortic uh, regression. And he, this is the, the way that we do calculate the quantitative uh, regurgitant volume and uh, also regurgitant fraction. Uh, we, we calculate the stroke volume across, across the LVOT and then the stroke volume across the RVOT. And from that, we do uh, subtract and we can calculate the regurgitant volume as well as regurgitant fraction. And uh, you can also, as I mentioned previously, that you can calculate the effective orifice area. Once you calculate the regurgitant volume, you can divide it by the VTI of the regurgitation. You can trace this, and then you get the VTI of the regurgitation. And then if you divide the volume of the regurgitant volume on this number, uh, you will get the effective orifice area. Uh, so uh, if it's more than 0 0.3, 0 0.3 or more, you will consider it as a severe. Uh, again, here an example. Uh, so you can see here, um, we calculated the LVOT. The LVOT diameter is 2.1. And we can, from this, we calculate the area multiplied by the LVOT VTI. And we get uh, a volume of 67. And here from the RVOT, we have diameter 2.1. And uh, we calculate the area and then multiply it by the aortic valve uh, VTI. And from this, you get the 48. Uh, and then when you subtract uh, 67 by 40. Uh, eight, you will get the regurgitant volume, which is 19. And then if you divide it by the LVOT stroke volume, you will get uh, the fraction, regurgitant fraction. And here it's 28, which is considered as a mild aortic regression. Uh, this is another example of patient with a severe uh, paravalvular leak. You will see that if you calculate here, we have a 10%, 20%, 15%. So it's add up. Uh, to be severe uh, regression. Uh, so this patient has a, a post uh, TAVI and uh, four valve, and he has a significant, most likely it has a significant valvular leak because uh, the valve itself, it was too deep, uh, insertion of the valve. Uh, so in this case, we either uh, recapture the valve and try to uh, put it higher, or sometimes we try to balloon it. Uh, and if it doesn't work, we can insert uh, another valve. This is another um, patient with a mechanical valve. You can see here that the patient has a thrombus uh, and this thrombus causing both, causing uh, stenosis as well as regurgitation. Uh, so the patient has significant CV regurgitation. It's intravalvular uh, regurgitation. Uh, with, uh, the patient has high velocity because this affecting the opening of the valve, the thrombus, and causing a high uh, stenosis as well as regurgitation. So uh, in terms of the mitral valve, so the mitral valve, we're gonna go through both. Uh, first, you will uh, evaluate the mitral valve by 2D and then by Doppler. Uh, so these are the common pathology that we, you can uh, see in the patient with the mitral, prosthetic mitral valve. You might see in, if the patient has a bioprosthetic, you will see degeneration, sometimes even thrombus. Uh, but the thrombus, we see it more commonly in the patient with the mechanical valve. And also you can see the panis uh, formation in the patient uh, with the uh, mechanical valve. And that can, both of these can cause a stenosis, sometimes even re uh, regurgitation. Uh, but most of the time it will be uh, causing a significant stenosis. Uh, so this is how uh, the bioprosthetic mitral valve looks in the TEE. You will see that the leaflet is very thin and it's uh, clear uh, that it's healthy uh, leaflet. On the other hand here, you will see that the patient has uh, thrombosis in the leaflet itself, and you will see that it's thick and thrombotic. Uh, here you will see that uh, this is the patient with the uh, bi-leaflet, and you will see here that only one uh, occluder is opening. And the other leaflet, it's not opening, it's stuck. Uh, and this could be either a secondary to uh, thrombosis or panis formation. Both can cause uh, stuck valve. And usually uh, this patient in the mitral valve, it will be stuck in the closure uh, position. So it will cause a stenosis. These are the parameters that we use uh, to evaluate the patient with a mitral prosthetic valve. So we say that uh, the velocity should be less than 1.9. Uh, 
uh, it can go all the way up to 2.2, uh, it will be acceptable. Uh, but it will say that normally it should be less than the velocity. It should be, uh, and the velocity by the continuous wave, of course, not by pulse wave uh, across the micro valve. Uh, it should be less than uh, 1.9 meter per second. The mean gradient should be uh, five or less. Uh, and we can calculate the dimensional velocity index. And this, we do this by dividing the BTI of the mitral valve by the BTI of the LVOT. So you need to be careful that the VTI here of the uh, prosthetic mitral valve, we calculate it by the continuous wave, not by the Doppler wave. So you have to use the continuous wave and trace it. And then from that, you will get the prosthetic mitral valve VTI and divide it by the LVOT VTI, which you usually do it by the pulse wave. And it normally it should be less than uh, 2.2. Uh, in the patient with the um, stenosis or even regurgitation, mitral valve regurgitation, they will have higher uh, ratio. Uh, also, you can calculate the effective orifice area from the LVOT stroke volume. You calculate the LVOT stroke volume or the RVOT stroke volume and divide it by the prosthetic valve uh, VTI and you will get uh, the effective orifice area. Pressure half time, it should be less than 130. Uh, some uh, references, they will tell you that it should be less than even 100 uh, to say that it's normal. Uh, you need to remember that, as I mentioned, that both uh, mitral regurg and uh, mitral stenosis, uh, the prosthetic valve, can give you high velocity, uh, can give you a, a high ratio, and can even give you sometimes high gradient. Um, but the, the way to differentiate between uh, the stenosis from the regurgitation by pressure half time. So in the stenosis, pressure half time will be elevated, but in the patient with the regurgitation, pressure half time should be normal. Uh, so this is very important even for your exam to differentiate between mitral uh, regurgitation from mitral stenosis. Uh, the other thing, maybe you, it can help, but not, it, it's not always there that if you have uh, a high uh, discrepancy between the peak pressure gradient and the mean pressure gradient, we always say this is secondary to uh, regurgitation, that this patient has regurgitation. Uh, because those patients with the regurgitation, they will have higher uh, pressure gradient than the mean gradient. So there will be some increase in the mean gradient, but the pressure gradient will be significantly higher. Uh, but those patients with the stenosis, they usually have both high uh, pressure gradient, a uh, big pressure gradient, as well as uh, mean pressure gradient. So uh, you can use this uh, diagram uh, to diagnose patient with the uh, stenosis versus patient with uh, regurgitation. So if the mitral uh, valve uh, prosthesis ratio, the one that I showed you, this is 2.3 here in this diagram, the, they recommended uh, 2.3 as a cutoff. So if it's less than 2.3, which is like 2.2 or less, you can say that this patient most likely has normal valve and does not have a need for any TEE or any further evaluation. But if the ratio is 2.3 or more, uh, then you will look to the velocity. So if the velocity less than 2.2, uh, it's uncertain because uh, as you see here that maybe 28% uh, has uh, MR, maybe 5% has um, uh, stenosis. So for this patient, you can consider uh, doing TEE for further evaluation. Of course, if, especially if the patient symptomatic, uh, you, you will you should do TEE. But if the patient has high rate with high velocity, you will look at the pressure half time. So if the pressure half time uh, normal, uh, less than normal, uh, you will say that the patient have mitral rigors. I don't know who uh, have the mic on. Uh, so if the pressure half time is high, then you will say that the patient has uh, MS. So this is how you differentiate. Uh, um, and this is important also in your exam. They might give you a case like this and they will give you these parameter. And then you, you have to say that the patient has mitral rigor, uh, prosthetic mitral rigor, or patient has uh, prosthetic mitral stenosis. Uh, as I told you here, it's very important uh, to know that when you calculate uh, the dimensional list index or uh, this ratio, very important to use the VTI of the continuous wave. 
So you see here, this is a continuous wave uh, across the mitral valve. And from this continuous wave, when you trace it, you will get the BTI, and then you will divide it by the LVOT to get the ratio. So I need you also to remember that the ratio that we did uh, for the aortic valve, we divide the LVOT BTI on the aortic valve. So this is why the ratio it was really low. But here it's opposite. We, we divided the mitral valve uh, BTI on the LVOT. So here the LVOT BTI will be in uh, dominator, will be the dominator. And the other one, uh, the LVOT BTI was the nominator. So this is, you just need to remember, so not to mix up uh, when you do the division. Uh, this is another, so yeah, this for, in this patient, uh, you see that when they divided, they got the ratio of 2.6. So we know that 2.6 will be significant. So if you use our uh, diagram here, we see that it's significant. And then we look to the velocity. Uh, here, the velocity, uh, it's not, uh, it's not, yes, 2.2 which is also considered as high. And then uh, the last step, you need to check the pressure uh, half time. Here, the pressure half time was not provided, but we can tell that here, the pressure half time, uh, it should be low uh, based on how it's look like. Like I can tell that it's uh, low. So if it's low, uh, we can say that this is uh, most likely actually it's uh, regurgitation. Here, uh, this question you will see that Mean pressure gradient was very high, uh, 15. Uh, pressure half time, it's also uh, elevated, more than 130. Uh, so once you see this, and velocity here also elevated. So once you see this, you will say that uh, this clearly, and you can see that it's not going uh, the steep of the uh, this graph. You will see that it's slowly going down. And that indicates that the pressure half time is high. And this is mean that the patient has uh, mitral stenosis. Uh, this is another case. You will see that you calculate uh, the uh, ratio that it's 1.6, which means it's less than 2.2. So if it's less than 2.2, we can say that this is normal, uh, even without doing any further evaluation. But if you, of course, do the other evaluation, you will see that the pressure half time for here is 66, which is normal. And mean pressure gradient, it's six. It's also acceptable. Um, uh, and even here, you don't need to do the effective orifice area. If it's normal, everything it's normal. You don't know, need to go all the way. But of course, you can calculate it. Uh, as I told you that it's better to, when you do the reporting, to report everything and to uh, help you later on when you have uh, the, if the same patient uh, with the high gradient, you can compare your gradient, you can compare your velocity, effective orifice area. So it would be very helpful for you when, with the repeat uh, study. Uh, here, another case, uh, you will see that uh, once you calculate the ratio, that the ratio uh, mitral valve uh, VTI across, uh, on the LVOT VTI, it's 6.9. So if it's 6.9, we know that it's elevated. Uh, then we look to the velocity uh, of the mitral valve prosthesis, and you will see that here the velocity is 2.6. So 2.6, we consider it as elevated, significantly elevated. And then we look to the pressure half time. Pressure half time here 220. So if the pressure have 220, we say that this is secondary to um, mitral stenosis. And then you can also calculate um, the effective orifice. So here we see that the stroke volume, we have almost uh, 58. So you divide 58 uh, by 104. So it will be, uh, the area will be less than one. Uh, so it will be uh, really significantly uh, stenosis in this patient. And also very important to remember that uh, although here we use the pressure half time uh, to diagnose patient with the stenosis, but we cannot calculate the effective orifice area based on the pressure half time. So if you remember when we did the native uh, valve, we said that uh, we divide 220 by the pressure half time to get the, uh, the, uh, the mitral valve area, but here we cannot use the same uh, equation. Uh, but we use the uh, pressure half time the threshold that we mentioned to help us to diagnose patient with the stenosis from patient with the mitral valve. Uh, here again, another patient, you will see that this patient have uh, pressure half time. Uh, the gradient will, was very high, 12. 
uh, pressure half time was almost 200 and effective orifice area was 0.9. Uh, this patient has uh, thrombus. So you will see that from the bar stern of view that the patient have a mass here. And this is a thrombus called affecting uh, the valve and causing uh, stenosis. Of course, the TEE will be the best test to be able to see uh, this thrombus. Uh, but you can see from this Doppler parameter that this patient have severe stenosis. Uh, here, one thing to mention that in the patient who's not significantly have a uh, significant gradient, but it has symptoms, you can always do for this patient exercise uh, uh, test. Uh, you can do it or uh, that will help you. If you see that there is an increase in the gradient, that indicates that the patient has uh, symptoms secondary to obstruction, or if it could be a patient with species mismatch, both going to have high gradient above 18 uh, with the exercise. In terms of the regurgitation, this is the table that we use uh, uh, for the patient post uh, uh, prosthetic uh, surgery, like my above surgery. surgery. That we look for multiple things. Uh, by Turkey, you can even look in the LV, uh, LV uh, size. Ibrahim, uh, I don't know who's. مسال حساب ايفون تقريبا بس دكتور انت تقدر تسوي له ميوت لانه انت الهوست طيب انا عندي دكتور اسوي له لي... المشكله اوكي هحاول ابس شوف طيب خلاص ممتاز سويت له ميوت شكرا Uh, so here uh, you will see that uh, this is the table that we usually use uh, when we evaluate patient, uh, when we have suspicion that the patient have regurgitation. Uh, so you can look for multiple things. Uh, the most important thing I will say from this table uh, to take away uh, that if the patient has uh, flow reversal in the pulmonary vein, this is a specific for uh, significant and severe uh, mitral regurg. Uh, the other thing also, you, you will look to the area of the jet, but sometimes it's difficult to see the area of the jet, uh, especially with the, in the patient with the mechanical valve, because those patients, they will have too much shadow. Uh, so you, of course, you can measure it and see what, if it's more than eight uh, or covering more than 40% of the LA, but it's really hard sometimes to do this with the mechanical valve because there will be a lot of shadowing. You cannot see it. And sometimes if the patient has paravalvular leak, it would be uh, difficult uh, to use this uh, uh, way to evaluate the severity of the valve. So the important one is the, I think, systolic flow reversal. Of course, you can calculate the regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction, effective orifice or area. You can do it all uh, by using the quantitative method through the cal calculating the stroke volume across the LVOT and do all these uh, the same way that we did uh, previously for uh, the aortic valve. A uh, couple of things, important thing, always uh, think about mitral valve, because uh, sometimes you will have clearly a more, uh, that the leaflet is opening very well, uh, but you will see that the velocity is high or the ratio is high. So whenever you see these things or the gradient is high, so always think that maybe the patient has a uh, baravalvular leak that, I, that it's not seen very well with the transthoracic. Uh, this patient, if, especially if they are symptomatic, uh, you need to do for this patient TEE to be able to see uh, this paravalvular leak. This is the approach that we usually use uh, in the patient, uh, especially those with the uh, post uh, catheter uh, intervention. So if the vena contractor, and you can use it the same for the patient with the post surgery, if the vena contractor uh, more than 0 0.7, 0 0.7 or more, uh, vena contractor area 0.4 or more, and there is a, a large uh, PISA, uh, or if the patient has a, a jet more than, I think here they said more than 50% of the LA, or they has a flow reversal, these are the criteria for severe mitral regurgitation. So if they have four criteria or more, you will say that this patient has a severe MR. And uh, if they have uh, the criteria for mild, you can say also this patient has mild. If it's between, you can use the quantitative method. 
uh, and the quantitative method, as, as I told you, that you're going to use, need to use the LVOT stroke volume in this case. So you need to calculate the stroke volume, and from the stroke volume uh, of the LVOT, you can calculate um, the, the volume of the uh, regurgitation. And, and, uh, and the way to do this, actually, this is important, that when you calculate let's say you calculate the LVOT stroke volume and the LVOT stroke volume is 50 ml. Uh, when you calculate uh, the stroke volume uh, across uh, the mitral uh, valve, the way we do it, because it's really difficult. If you see here, the me mechanical valve, yeah, yeah, it's difficult. You cannot, like you, you don't have a way to measure the annulus very well. Like in the patient with the native valve, uh, if you remember, uh, when we talked about how to evaluate the regurgitation volume, we said that you calculate the annulus, you measure the annulus. And from the annulus of the mitral valve, uh, you, you multiply it by the VTI of the, uh, by pulse wave across the mitral valve annulus. And from that, you can calculate the stroke volume across the mitral valve. And then you can do uh, subtract that from the LVOT stroke volume and to calculate the regurgitant volume. But here it's difficult uh, to know what is uh, the annulus uh, and measure the annulus because it's not, it cannot be used uh, the, uh, the way that we used it in the native valve. But the way that we use it here in the mechanical valve is by measuring the stroke volume through the uh, Simpson way. So as you remember, the Simpson way, we measure the volume in the, of the LV uh, diastole and the volume in the LV systole. Uh, and the difference, this you can say, this is the mitral valve stroke volume. And then you minus that from the LVOT stroke volume. And from that, you will get uh, the regurgitant volume. So again, so you will measure the volume of the LV diastole. And then uh, the volume of the systole, of the LV systole. And then from that, you will get the almost this will be equivalent to the mitral valve stroke volume. And then from that, you will subtract the LVOT stroke volume. Uh, like you will see here that the LVOT stroke volume in this case, uh, when we calculate it, it's 43. But when we did the, uh, LV, uh, the LV size, we calculate the stroke volume uh, using the 2D method, the Simpson method, uh, we got 64. So basically we do 64 minus 43, which is, and we get then uh, 21. And so this is the regurgitant volume of the mitral valve. And then if you divide it uh, by the 2D uh, stroke volume, you will get the regurgitant fraction. So this is the method that we use uh, to calculate the regurgitant volume in the patient with the mechanical valve. Uh, this is another uh, case. Uh, if you see here, this is a TE view. Uh, you will see that you have here uh, two leaflet, mechanical valve, two leaflet, and you have severe paravalvular leak, uh, big leak. And you can see it here from the uh, 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 transthoracic. And from the 3D, you can see it here in this area. There is a significant um, uh, paravalvular leak. The patient also has a small hearing, but this is the very significant. And you can see here, when you calculate the ratio, the ratio will be 4.2. So it's significantly high. And then also, if you look to the uh, velocity of the mitral valve, you will see that the velocity is uh, 2.8, which is significantly more than uh, the velocity of 1.9. Uh, and then uh, you will see that the pressure half time here, it's normal. So indicate that this increase in the velocity and ratio is secondary to regurgitation, not secondary to stenosis. Uh, finally, we'll go quickly through the tricuspid uh, prosthetic valve. We don't have a lot of data uh, regarding the tricuspid, but the threshold here uh, to say that the patient has uh, significant stenosis, if the velocity more than 1.7, uh, mean gradient more uh, six and more, uh, pressure half time more than 230, we consider this is as a significant stenosis. The ratio that we used with the mitral valve cannot be applied here in the uh, tricuspid. Uh, so of course, you're gonna need to do a TEE to be able to evaluate to see if there is any uh, degeneration of the valve, and then if the patient's symptomatic. Uh, uh, of course, uh, that 
would be an indication uh, for uh, intervention. Uh, on the other hand, for in terms of the tricuspid regurg, uh, we, we, we can use multiple uh, criteria. I will say this is, would be better. Uh, so you will see the, the important one to look for always is the systolic flow reversal in the hepatic vein. It's very simple and easy way to say that the patient has significant uh, TR or not in the patient with the prosthetic valve. So if there is a reversal, systolic reversal in the hepatic vein, that will indicate that the patient has uh, severe, uh, you know, uh, severe uh, regurgitation. Uh, of course, you, if you can see the vena contractor, try to measure it. And if it's 0.7 or more, that indicates that the patient has severe uh, uh, TR. Uh, other thing also, you will see the uh, e-velocity, all the thing that we mentioned previously. That, uh, it's almost like, yeah, and it's, there's some similarity to the mitral uh, regurg. Uh, here, maybe the uh, other difference is if the effective orifice area will be the same, uh, the threshold, like the mitral valve area, but the regurgitant volume here, the threshold is uh, 45. More than 45, we consider it as significant. Uh, lastly, it's the pulmonary uh, uh, valve. The pulmon most of the patients with the pulmonary valve uh, disease, usually they have congenital anomalies. Uh, so uh, we have, uh, we say that in terms of the suggestion, uh, the thing that just suggests uh, significant uh, pulmonary regurg. Uh, first, uh, we look to the uh, the JIT. Uh, so the, if the JIT is less than 25, consider um, from the, compared to the annulus, uh, the pulmonary annulus, we consider this as a mild regurg. If it's more than 50%, we consider it as a severe. We can calculate the regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction. Uh, we're going to use the same method here. You're going to calculate the stroke volume across the RVOT, and the stroke volume across the LVOT and do subtract and divide uh, by the total uh, stroke volume of the RVOT. And from that, you can calculate regurgitant uh, fraction, assuming that you don't have aortic regurg. And from that, you can calculate the regurgitant fraction. If it's more than 50%, you consider it as severe pulmonary regurg. The other thing also here would be very helpful. And I always re remind the uh, echo technician to try to get this, these images for us, which is the reversal of the pulmonary vein. Uh, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, the reversal of the pulmonary artery. The reversal of the pulmonary artery, usually we see it in the patient with the significant pulmonary regurg. Uh, so you, ca uh, you can do both. You can, uh, and from the short axis, you can check the reversal of the trunk, uh, from the trunk of the pulmonary artery, and then from the branches. If the patient has a reversal uh, in these, uh, the stolic reversal, uh, then you will say that uh, the patient has significant uh, pulmonary regurg. So imagine this similar to when we do that uh, in the patient with the aortic regurg, we do the, re the stoic reversal in the aorta. Here we do it within the pulmonary artery. So if the patient has reversal, we can say that the patient has severe pulmonary regurg. On the other hand, the stenosis, we usually, if the peak velocity more than three, we consider this as stenosis. For homograft, it should be less. So the threshold here, more than two, we consider as uh, stenosis. Um, and the mean pressure gradient also here, uh, the threshold is 20 for uh, xenograft and for uh, homograft is uh, 15. And of course, you, you uh, sometimes it's difficult, I know that to see the valve itself, but sometimes TE can help uh, with the evaluating the leaflet itself. Uh, but basically this is how we uh, measure uh, if see if there is any significant. Uh, the other thing also to uh, look for, it's um, in the patient with the pulmonary regurg uh, that we look to the pressure half time. So in the patient with the pulmonary regurg, if the pressure half time uh, less than 100, we consider that this is as a CV. Uh, also, if there is an early termination uh, of the uh, regurgitation uh, low, that will also uh, indicate that the patient has uh, a severe pulmonary regurg, you will see here that there is an early termination uh, of the flow. And that indicate uh, the patient has severe. And if you measure the pressure half time, also it will be less than 100, indicate that the patient has a severe pulmonary regurg. Uh, here uh, are two cases uh, for the patient. Here, the patient with the mild regurg, you will see that here, if you calculate the the ratio and the percentage of the uh, regurgitation uh, to the annulus, you will see that 
this is will be very small, less than 25%. But here, on the other hand, this will be more than uh, 50%, which indicate that the patient has a severe pulmonary regression. Also, if you see the with the continuous wave, we see that here the regurgitation flow is very dense, uh, which indicate that the patient has uh, severe uh, pulmonary uh, regurgitation. And the pressure half time here, you will see that it's uh, 99. That will indicate that the patient has a severe uh, pulmonary regurg. Uh, so on the other hand, here the, this patient has, like if you calculate the pulmonary, uh, the pressure half time, it will be uh, not uh, like it will be maybe more than 500, and uh, you will see that the flow itself it's not dense, indicate that there is no significant uh, regurg in this case. Uh, finally, also uh, always remember that the patient with the atrial fibrillation that you need always uh, to make sure that the heart rate is controlled and you need to average at least five beats to be able to accurately uh, measure uh, the gradient in this patient and also uh, effective orifice area and all these stuff. Do you have any question? Any question? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, when you calculated uh, for mitral uh, prosthetic mitral valve stenosis, do you yeah. calculate it on pulse wave or uh, CW? This Malish. is my first question. E wave velocity when we calculate it, we calculate it on CW or pulse wave. Al and E will A for velocity, Natalie? E velocity. And E velocity. E velocity. E velocity. Kula fil mitral stenosis, hagal prosthetic mitral stenosis, as well as al prosthetic, or always prosthetic for what? For stenosis or for regurgitation. You're always going to do it with the continuous weight. Always do it with the continuous weight. Another question. Can I use the valve size uh, to calculate uh, the mitral valve stroke volume since I cannot measure the annulus? Uh, yes, a good question. Hatta, we can ask the same question on the aortic valve. And this is always we ask this question. Can we use uh, the size to say what is the LVOT? And when we calculate the LVOT stroke volume, can we use the size of the uh, valve, uh, prosthetic valve to say that خلاص, if the size is 23, we can say that this LVOT diameter uh, is uh, 23 and can we use it for the stroke volume? The answer for both, no, we cannot use it. So it's very important to measure it. And if uh, for the, in terms of the LVOT stroke volume, you have to measure it. For the mitral valve, you cannot, and you really cannot. And had the, the problem even, it's very difficult to measure. Uh, and if, even if you want to measure, uh, the pulse wave, uh, because usually when we want to measure uh, the stroke volume across the LVOT or mitral uh, valve, native mitral valve, usually we use the pulse wave. We want it exactly at the annulus to be able to measure uh, the flow, exactly a stroke volume in the annulus. Uh, the problem here, always the velocity will be uh, very high and there will be always aliasing uh, in the valve itself. Uh, so it's really you cannot use the size base uh, to determine the stroke volume. Uh, so the only way to do it is by uh, do the 2D or 3D. Yeah, and if you can do a 3D volume for the LV, and you can measure the uh, uh, LV uh, volume in the diastole and then LV volume in systole, and then you, you do subtract, and you can uh, from that uh, calculate the mitral stroke volume. <laughs> Any other question? Yes, I can put the recycle. If you have any other question, you can always send it to Ibrahim. Ibrahim can send it to me, and I can answer anytime. The important one uh, about the board exam and for your board exam, 
uh, I show you the, that graph and you can feel uh, how to evaluate patient with the uh, increased gradient across the aortic valve, then you have to ask this question about that graph. And, uh, so it's very important to memorize that graph very well. And also to, do, uh, to know how to differentiate between patient with the mitral rigor versus mitral stenosis based on the dogma um, criteria. And if you, if you took this away from this lecture, it will be the most important one, and I think for your exam. In case of AFib, can we do calculus in one image? Uh, so uh, for, uh, in terms of the pressure gradient, uh, will pressure uh, will uh, velocity, always you need to average five. Then in, 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 you can do it in one image, but the, you can tell the echo technician to increase, uh, uh, to, uh, to try to increase uh, the velocity. If you increase the velocity, the speed, uh, you will have more uh, waves uh, in one image. Uh, so you want uh, at least five image uh, waves uh, to uh, trace, uh, to be able to determine uh, the pressure gradient and pressure velocity. This is the only thing that you need to know about the AFF. For the goal, five, five waves you need uh, for the pressure gradient and velocity. With the feature. Assalamualaikum, doctor. Yes. Uh, doctor, I have a question. How I will be calculate the vena contractor area? As I know, okay, we can just do the diameter vena contractor for any of the regurgitation to value. But uh, you said in your lecture in vena contractor, contractor VC area, which is a little bit is confused how I can use the v, uh, vena contractor contact area. Uh, this is a good question. Let me show you now how to do it. You, you, of course, you have two ways to do this. You can do the 2D or 3D. Uh, so in 2D, let me show you here. Uh, so the, for the 2D, if you want to do it through D, 2D, you need to use, it's better to use the pipeline uh, or what's called explain. Uh, so you will do explain. You will put the, your bar external view here. Uh, I'm sharing now. Uh, so you will do barstown view, and then you do explain across this point in the other side of the vena contractor, at the same side of the vena contractor. And from that, uh, you will have the other image, which is usually this, and then you can trace it. So basically you will trace it. Of course, you can do it with, uh, by TEE, I usually use not 2D, I use 3D. And 3D would be more accurate. Uh, so I will use the 3D, uh, with the color, uh, and then I, I will use the Q lab to be able to, and I will measure it exactly at the site of the vena contract area. As I told you, if you go too deep to the LVOT, you will overestimate the area. This is for uh, the aortic uh, valve. For the mitral valve, it's really difficult to do uh, uh, the by the transthoracic because, as you, as I told you, that you will have too much shadowing. It's very difficult to do it. So I usually do it with the TEE. So once I have this view, I can do a color uh, 3D, and then I will measure exactly the area uh, of the vena contractor area from this view. Also, you can do it indirectly. Uh, the way to do it indirectly is by calculating the effective orifice area of the regurgitant. Uh, so once you calculate uh, the volume of the regurgitant volume, you will divide it by the um, uh, the uh, continuous wave of the regurgitation, the VTI of the uh, regurgitation. Uh, so if you put the, your uh, continuous wave across the regurgitant uh, flow and you measure the VTI, once you divide the volume, regurgitant volume by the VTI, you will calculate the effective orifice area. But in terms of the vena contract area, the way to do it, it's either by 2D or 3D. Uh, as I told you, 2D, you can do it for the aortic valve, but it's always 3D will be the optimal to do it for both uh, aortic valve and mitral valve. But you have to do it in like 3D color. And it's very easy to do it. Like once you practice it, it, it will be uh, much easier to do it all the time. Any other question? Okay. Yeah, a bit of a question. 